everybody. Welcome to On the Menu. It's May the 5th, 2020. I believe this is On the Menu number eight. Our special guest today is Mr. Rodney Eaton from the famous Eaton family, one of the most well thought of group of people in our entire county. Rodney, welcome. How are you? Thank you. Doing very well, Bob. Right. Rodney, I'd like to start off a little bit. Would you tell us just a little bit about your upbringing and then transform that into how you got into business? And then I understand you have a list of things that you'd like to talk about after that. Yes, I do. Um, thank you, Bob. Um, yeah, I am, uh, I'm from Alamogordo, born and raised. Uh, my folks uh, moved here in the early 60s out of Arizona, Globe, Arizona area. And, um, and so we, they started their family here. I graduated high school here. Um, shortly after that, I went to a trade school up in Utah and uh, did that for a couple of years. And uh, when I came back in down Gordo, went to work for Zuni Electric. And that was back in late uh, 1981. So, and I've been with this same company ever since um, and uh, worked my way through the field and uh, I guess foreman and eventually vice president and eventually president. And, um, and that's kind of the, uh, the short story right there, Bob. Okay, great. Tell us a little bit about your family. Uh, I am married to Carrie. Carrie Messer was her uh, maiden name. And uh, we have three children. Bryce is the oldest. Candace uh, is in the middle. And we have Trevor, uh, who is our youngest son. Um, and they pretty much were raised in this area. Um, Candace went off to uh, school out in Arizona for a year or so. And, uh, but they're all making their, their homes and their livings here in this community. Rodney, do any of your children work with you in your business? You know, they do. Um, Bob Bryce has, uh, is the vice president of Zuni Electric. Uh, Trevor is uh, our estimator. Okay. And then we have uh, Candace, uh, Candace is as a licensed journeyman uh, in the field. Okay, great. Very good. What would you like to start off telling us about today? First, if you could share with us the title of what you want to talk about, and then we'll start up topic number one. Okay, so the title is um, Culture in the Workplace, and that's kind of where it starts, and I have uh, several items that go below that, um, and if you're okay, I will go ahead and begin, Bob. You bet. Go right ahead. Okay, and so I first want to talk about the chamber just for a moment or two. Um, you know, about three years ago, my office manager came into my office and he said, uh, <clears throat> there's a guy by the name of uh, G.B. Oliver here that wants to speak to you. And of course, my first thought was, you know, G.B.'s got the wrong building and he certainly has the wrong name. And before I knew it, there was this, um, this big old redneck standing in my doorway. And before I could get to the back door, he was sitting at my desk. And uh, he began to visit with me about my participation or lack thereof with the chamber. And uh, to be quite honest, I didn't have any uh, association with the chamber other than the fact that we were members. And, and that's all I knew about it, really. Um, and so, you know, GB, he can, uh, he can sell an ice cube to an Eskimo. And uh, the longer he sat there, uh, the more obviously my involvement became with the chamber. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't answer him that at that particular moment. I needed to think about the commitment and uh, the things that uh, were taking place in my life. And so that evening I went to my folks house and I uh, spoke to my dad about it because I remember as I was growing up, uh, he was always very involved in the chamber. And so I, I quizzed him about it to get his opinion. And, uh, and he told me that the chamber was um, the greatest organization uh, 
then and now that the Amagorda community could ever have. And that was his honest opinion of that. He served very many, a, a long, a lot of time, a lot of years. And mm -hmm. that was his opinion. So that kind of helped me make my decision. And so I called GB back the next day and said, okay, you know, I'm in. And so thus began my, uh, my journey on the, the board of directors of the chamber. And I can tell you that, um, you know, I didn't know what these organizations were like because I never did belong to one of them. And my, my first thought was it was, uh, and no offense, but my first thought was it was a group of self-serving, um, you know, in the know type of people that took advantage of the organization. Um, I couldn't have been more wrong about that. Um, the facts are that this group, uh, they work hard. They, they sacrifice personal time. Uh, they sacrifice resources for the betterment of the community. And I can tell you that uh, I am proud to be associated with them. And I hope that uh, the members out there in the community uh, can share that same pride. Uh, it, is, it is well warranted. So, okay, so uh, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I hope that I can say something that is noteworthy, um, that there's some uh, golden nuggets along the way that you can pick up that will hopefully help in your personal lives and your business lives. So I, I wanna start off with talking a little bit about the IEC, because this is where some of my topic uh, headers come from. The IEC is Independent Electrical Contractors. And that's kind of our way of not being unionized, no offense, but, um, and so in this IEC, uh, we have an apprenticeship program. That's a four year program that uh, we make all of our guys go through. We have graduated probably 15 to 16. I don't recall uh, members of our crew have graduated this, this uh, class. We, uh, all of our new hires, um, they don't get hired unless they agree to go to school. Um, and so it's very important to us, the education side of that. Um, within this IEC, there's a forum group. And that's really what my, I want to make a point to is, is if in your industry, there's any way possible to be, to join a forum group in our certain situation, we're in a group of 13 contractors that are nationwide. And uh, we share everything. We share P&Ls, we share best practices. Um, it's, it's really nice to have a company that is similar to yours, but that is not in your competitive region that you can share these things with. We have a monthly conference call. We meet face-to-face -face twice a year for a couple of days. Um, and we either have educational speakers come in or we educate each other. Um, and it, it really works well. I would hope that in your industry or your line of business, a lot of times I think they call them, you know, they have buyers groups that do a very similar type of thing. And I would certainly encourage you to, to look into that and see what uh, you can find for your industry. And so from that forum group is where I <clears throat> came up with a couple of my topics here. And the first topic that I have is on culture. And this is not the kind of culture that is considering a uh, civilization necessarily or a period of time. This is the kind of culture that is created within uh, the walls of your own business. And so <clears throat> what is a company culture? Um, you know, simply put, it is pretty much just the way we do things around here kind of situation. Uh, the complexity of it is, is it involves people and it involves employees and it involves managers <clears throat> and those people that are in charge because they are responsible for driving and creating an atmosphere that your people want to work in, um, a place they want to come to work. And so it falls upon the owners or the manager's shoulders to drive this positive culture in your business. Um, 
and I, you know, like, like most things, you know, so goes management is so goes the business. And so those who are leaders in your business have got to have a positive attitude. Uh, they have to set the, the stride. They got to set the pace. They have to be the example. Um, now, it's possible in these situations where owners, managers, people who lead uh, can suffer burnout. And so if you're an owner and you're suffering this burnout and you don't feel that you can be the leader of this positive culture that you need to survive by, then you simply need to assign that to somebody who can. Um, if, if you're suffering burnout, and the only reason I bring this up, because I've seen it, I know it happens. Um, as owners out there, as managers out there, people with a lot of responsibility, it is up to us to recognize this issue, to work through it and get over it and uh, become vested in our companies again. Something we have to be careful about. So some other things that play into business culture are things like faith, uh, honesty, integrity, respect, uh, respect. Did I mention respect? Um, when it comes to working and playing well with others, uh, sometimes that becomes a little tricky. And my recommendation to you in a situation like that is, uh, is to stay in your lane. Do your job that you were hired for the best way you know how and do it for the money that you agreed to do it for. Don't worry about your coworkers. Give them the space to do their job as well. You know, a lot of times I think that uh, we believe maybe our coworkers do less work for more pay than what we do. Well, you know, you need to stay out of their soup because that's really none of your business. You know, that's between them and the person that hired them. Um, and so you've got to find a way to get along with your coworkers, stay in your lane. And it's, it's a bit of a balance. It's a bit of a juggling act. You got to stay in your lane, but you also got to be a team player. And so staying in your lane doesn't mean that you can't think outside the box and that you can't bring good, input to your uh, to your owner to your boss um, but it means do your job uh, stay focused on your job and do your job um, so positive culture creates a good working atmosphere if you cannot get along then you cannot have a good working atmosphere and that's just the bottom line so so be a team player and and work in that direction I guess as a leader, um, Rodney, I think you muted your mic. Michelle, could you unmute Rodney's mic, please? I'm about now, Bob. There, now you're back. Thank you. Okay. How long was I muted? <laughs> Just a couple of seconds. Okay, okay. So where so where I was going with that last that last statement was, you know, as as owners and uh, leaders in our businesses, you know, at some point we are going to choose to step down from the organization. And so when we step down from that organization, not even lock in my truck. The question would be, what would be your legacy? You know, can you can you control the culture? in your company. There's things that you have to do on purpose. I'm gonna try. So let me let me talk about um, just for a moment your hiring practices. When you set up an interview, you need to have some parameters written up that meet the culture that you're after. And I, I would recommend that you don't hire on the first interview by any means. You always call them in for a second interview. And if they don't meet the parameters of the culture that you have established, 
then it's an, it's an automatic no hire. I mean, you know, because culture uh, in the way that we're talking about it, in the positive nature of it, is a little hard to teach. I'm not saying it's not teachable, but it's so much better if you can hire those individuals who already line up with your type of culture. Um, so this is what I'd recommend as well. I would recommend that you build an advisory team within your business. And um, it doesn't have to be a huge group, but I can just tell you how we do it at our company. Let me put it this way. I can tell you how we try to do it at our company is we've built an advisory team that involves the management, of course, and it involves our office manager, and it involves um, a, some guys from the field. And so we have these meetings and we bring all the brains to the table and we try to figure out pretty much every two weeks, what does our company look like and what do we want it to look like? Um, and we work on the culture of our company constantly uh, as we are out in the field, you know, we want our trucks to be clean. We want our guys to be clean. We want to be professional looking. And that is super important, uh, certainly to me. So you're going to have a culture one way or the other. That's just the way it is. So it could be bad or it could be good. Um, you need to be proactive in driving it to the positive side. And, and stick into your guns um, and create something that, that you want your business to be known by. That's super important. So, uh, Bob, I'm moving on to another topic. Anything from you at this point? Oh, sounds great. Is the next one about engagement? It is engagement. Yes, sir. Okay. Go right ahead. Thank you. So, in 2019, just last year, um, they did an employee engagement report. And so what they did for this report is they interviewed 3,000 people that were from different industries uh, across the nation, pretty much. <clears throat> and they roughly came up with 20% of people, and this is going to go the direction you don't think it's going to go, 20% of the people who are, are engaged at their jobs while at work. So... Good night, people. Look at, do the math. It, uh, it's simple. It's 80% that are not fully engaged doing their job while they're at work. And so that, you know, obviously computes to the fact that um, we don't have maximum production. Uh, and if we don't have maximum production, it directly affects the bottom line. Um, Rodney, could you clarify something for me? What, sure. uh, how would you define, be, define being engaged? I can, you know, basically, I'll put it this way. And, and, and you know, I don't want to use too many construction terms because that might not be appropriate. But, um, you know, you pay your guys for a 40-hour week. And uh, in our world, we want as close to a 40-hour week as we can possibly get. Um, we, we, were, we were kind of seeing where possibly the night activities before were creating a work habit for the next day. And so, and so we created something there. And let me, let me go this far, Bob, and then maybe that'll answer your, your question. Uh, Alan Bell, our office manager, who is also part of our uh, advisory team, came up with a simple one-sheet uh, form, a document, uh, to help our guys kind of set some goals for themselves. And so let me describe the document to you real quick. The, uh, the upper third of the page just simply has lines on it. The lower two thirds of the page have days of the week. And so at the end of one week on those lines at the top third of the page, they would write down the tasks and the goals and the uh, things they need to get accomplished the next week. Okay, and then um, during that next week, each day, they keep a daily log on what they did to accomplish those tasks. So, so instead of just getting to work and working at a, a mundane pace, I would call it, 
They get to work on Monday morning. They know what they're doing. They have their goals set out before them and they begin to attack those, those tasks day by day, logging each day what was, has been accomplished. And then those sheets are turned in to management. We review them. Um, we see how they did. Uh, it's become also a log for us to uh, follow the progress of, of jobs because we're not always out in the field. And so it's become a very helpful, um, simple, yet effective uh, log system that is um, laced with goals, accomplishment task goals. And so I don't know if anything like that would fit into um, your businesses, but you know, it, it just was part of trying to stay away from the costly disengagement possibilities of getting maximum production uh, for, for equal pay, you know. Um, and, and we know we lose production every day. We're just trying to minimize the amount of production that we lose by this format. Um, <clears throat> again, in all the things that I talk about, I'm not going to tell you that we are 100% good at it, but it, they are all uh, works, they're all works in process that we're, that we're trying to accomplish. So, Bob, does that kind of answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so I don't have much more on the topic of engagement, other than the fact that disengagement, again, it affects the bottom line, it affects morale, um, it affects the relationships that you have between coworkers. You know, I can tell you that if a coworker in our crew doesn't pull his weight, um, it's, it's pretty rough on him. You know, uh, we want guys who don't talk a lot and don't work a lot. And, uh, and so sometimes that's, uh, it's a hard combination there, but. Okay, so moving on to my next topic. Um, and I don't know, Bob, if I ended up with these in the same order that you have them. Um, but the next one is Eat That Frog. Right, this is and, the one I wanna hear about. Yeah, so Eat That Frog, it's, it's a book actually. And if you've never read this book, I would certainly encourage reading this book. Um, and what it does is it teaches you to take the most daunting task you have of the day and, and do it first, knock it out. Maybe that's after your caffeine fix, but the first task of the day, make it your worst task, get it done and get it over with. And the second task of the day, make it your next worst task. Um, and the magic to this is it, it builds some accomplishment. It allows you to set yourself up for the rest of the day. As the day wears on, you, and I'm sure you, that you've noticed this, as the day wears on, it becomes tougher to knock out the tough issues. You know, you, be, you become tired at the end of the day, um, you know, maybe a little bit edgy at the end of the day. And so your best bet is to, um, knock these things out first thing. And so basically it, you know, it's open wide and eat that frog. Um, get the bad things, the worst things that you have to do that day out of the way um, as quickly as you can. And then the rest of your day will, will be much more productive and much more better for you. It is a book, Eat That Frog. I would recommend that you read it. Um, the gist of it is just what I told you, but it's, but it's a good read, it's a short read. And it will help you realign possibly the things that you are doing, uh, your tasks your, that you do each day. Um, and the other thing about that is as you, as you realign the tasks that you do each day, you may recognize some tasks that you as an owner or you as a manager do that maybe you should not do, that maybe you should delegate those. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to kind of purge your uh, daily task list, uh, putting the toughest ones at the first. So, Bob, any questions on that? No, sir. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next one. So a few years ago, well, 
a few years ago, we did some, uh, we were involved in some training with Zig Ziglar. And we've actually trained with Zig Ziglar, you know, roughly three times now. Uh, we did a couple of times with our, with our whole company. And then we brought Zig Ziglar in, uh, or his trainer in, and we put on a youth session for teenagers. And uh, we felt it was very successful. Um, and so anyway, the instructor that uh, works for Zig Ziglar is a guy by the name of Matt Rush. And the things that he taught our company, uh, I really see as invaluable. Um, he, he taught us so many things uh, in his session. We did, we did two, you know, not to shut, because it was the whole company and not to shut the whole company down. We did two half day sessions. Uh, we had them over there at First National Bank. We utilized their basement. And uh, we did two half day sessions, two different times, a couple of years apart. And I can tell you that I literally saw um, it changed the lives of some of my employees um, after this class. Um, it teaches you, uh, obviously, goal setting, to look inward, uh, to be positive, to, um, to do so many things like that. And it's just, uh, I, can't, I can't recommend this type of training enough. And I know some of you have gone through this type of training before as well. Um, and so one of the things that Matt Rush talked to us about, he gave us a phrase, and that phrase has been forever etched in my mind. And, um, and I really think if you get it, this phrase that I'm fixing to share with you, if you get it, it may very well be the most important golden nugget that you might pick up during this session. So I would hope that you would write this down. So this is the phrase, get over yourself. It is not always about you. Get over yourself. It is not always about you. And so a little story behind that. I was speaking in church one day and I used this phrase. And as my eyes scanned the congregation, I came across the eyes of my beautiful bride and I could tell instantly that that might have been a phrase that would have been better left not used in that particular setting. But it was too late. It was already out there. Um, and so let me explain this to you the way I view it anyway. And, and I can tell you that it has changed the way I look at things uh, tremendously, actually. Um, so the phrase, get over yourself, it's not always about you, is in no way meant to stifle who you are. No way. Um, it is, in fact, just the opposite. It is to cause you to get out of your comfort zone, similar to what I'm doing today. <laughs> and um, it's cause you to get out of your comfort zone. It's a chance to visualize yourself as being bolder, more courageous, um, laughing out loud at yourself, um, leading someone else to a great idea and then making them the hero of that idea. You know, it's things like that. Um, we don't always have to put ourselves first. We should actually never put ourselves first. Um, it's, about, it's about loving thy neighbor as thyself. It's about doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's those kind of things. Um, if you embrace this phrase in the right manner, it will uh, change your perspective on a lot of things that you do. Um, get over yourself. It's not always about you. So thank you. Uh, Bob, moving on again, anything that you want to throw out there? Regarding the, the saying that you just went over, are you saying that that is about serving others? It's about serving others. It's about, you know, let's take this situation right here, for instance. <clears throat> if anybody gets anything out of this session, and I hope they do, and I don't know if they will, but I hope they do, then that was me being, uh, putting myself in front of this little computer here when this is not my comfort zone whatsoever. And so that's kind of what it is. It's you 
doing things that otherwise maybe you wouldn't do, you know. Um, and so, uh, and it is, it's about serving others. It's about putting others first. You know, I'm convinced and I can't remember where I read this. It was some motivational speaker at some point. And they said, if, and maybe some of you know this, if you help enough other people get what they want out of life, then you're going to be fine. The things that you want will come to you automatically if you help enough other people get the things out of life that they desire. And so maybe it's along those lines. I don't know. It's, it's not a, a phrase to um, not put yourself out there. Um, it's a phrase to put yourself out there and do good things for people. And you know that you'll reap the rewards from that um, one way or the other, not being the reason you do it, but it automatically happens that way. Thank you. Tell me about the greatest asset. Greatest asset, okay. So I'd ask you out there, who? what is your greatest asset? Is it the product that you produce? Is it the service that you provide? Is it your facility? Is it your location? Is it simply your money? I don't know. What's your greatest asset? That's the question at hand. I would suggest that your greatest asset is your employees. Not all of you, but a lot of you out there um, would not be in business without your employees. Uh, some work with, with, uh, within different realms of that, but but basically most of us would not be out there without their employees. We would not be the company that we are without our employees. So my message to you about that is to treat them well. Give them the tools to be successful, um, both for you and for them as individuals. Um, I guarantee you their home life and their work life are inseparable. Um, if they're not productive, positive citizens in a roundabout way, then they're not going to be great employees for you. And so part of this training that we did uh, with um, the Zig Ziglar stuff, different things like that, it wasn't as much company oriented as it was personally oriented, knowing that we would reap the benefits of that. Um, and so your greatest asset is, in fact, your employees. Uh, send them to the seminars, send them to training, um, educate them the best that you can. Um, they will become, if nothing else, they will respect you for what you're trying to do for them. They will become uh, even a greater asset to you as this time goes on. They will be a top drawer producer for you and for themselves. So I'm a firm believer in that. And you know, it's no secret that, um, that I'm proud of the culture and of the crew and of the staff that we have at Zuni Electric. You know, we run about 18 guys in the field on an average and we have five people in the office. And uh, for that size of company, we do a decent volume not always, but we can do a decent volume. And, uh, and so I'm proud of this, of this company that we have. Um, because what happens is when that company is out in the field or when your company is on a service call or delivering or whatever they're doing and they're out in the community, they represent your company, but more importantly, they represent you personally. Um, and if they don't represent me personally very well, then that is completely on me. You know, if you don't train them the way to go, then more than likely they won't go that way. So it's a hands-on situation. <clears throat> I can tell you that uh, at Zuni Electric, we've spent many dollars over the years uh, in training, uh, some of it from Dale Carnegie, some of it from Zig Ziglar, some of it from Billy Riggs, uh, set up by the chamber here. Um, and it's a little difficult, I guess, to, um, 
put that on a spreadsheet maybe and and see what your return is on your investment. That's a little hard to put down on paper, but I have no regrets of any of it. It's something that we will continue to do because we are convinced, completely convinced that uh, it has made us the company that we are today. Um, and so I would not, uh, not do it. Um, a good positive culture, I can tell you, is no accident. You have to drive for it. You have to put the right things in place. It's going to cost you a little bit of money, possibly. Um, but at the end of the day, it's worth it, completely worth it. Thank you. Uh, tell us about building a winning team. Building a winning team uh, goes along with the training. Um, <clears throat> like we said, we have, uh, in, our, in our area or for our company, we do an apprenticeship program. Um, and we've, uh, we don't allow hires without going through that apprenticeship program. It's a four year program, so it's a huge commitment. But it puts out, and, and you know, these guys are of the perfect age for production. And so with the perfect age for production and some education behind them, um, we teach them the professional skills, I hope, by, by doing some of the things that we do uh, in-house. We have meetings every Monday morning uh, tied to a safety topic, but also a lot of times we'll do training. Um, you know, obviously we haven't done this in a few weeks, but, but every Monday morning we get together and these meetings will last about 30 minutes. We talk about uh, projects that week. We talk about who's on what jobs and these meetings are invaluable to us. And, you know, it's funny, I reached out to some of my guys before this started and I asked him, you know, okay, so I think you're an awesome company. What do you think makes us a good company? You know, and, uh, and several of them replied back to that. And one of them was those Monday morning meetings because it feel, it makes them feel, you know, because they work in small crews most of the time, uh, but it makes them feel part of a group. It, uh, we, we try to inform them about jobs that are coming, jobs that we're bidding. We don't really hold anything back from them because I feel like they have a need to know. And the more they know about what we're doing in the office, the more engaged they are. Um, and so all that is part of building uh, a winning team. I think, uh, you know, and everybody knows communication is the key. Um, and we try to uh, do that to the best of our ability. Great. So do I get to ask you a few questions now, Rodney? As long as they're not too tough, Bob, you'd bet. Go no, ahead. No, they won't be. First, I want to let everybody know that if you have a question for Rodney, you can send it to me on the chat part of this Zoom conference, or you can text me at 430-0548. So a couple of questions for you, Rodney, would you consider your life a success? And why or why not? Well, um, I guess it. I guess it depends, Bob, on how you measure success. So, okay. um, <clears throat> I don't measure success um, by Zuni Electric. I measure success by uh, the people around me. Um, I measure success uh, by my family. I measure success by my faith, mm -hmm. um, by my health. You know, I, I've I've uh, dealt with some health issues over the over the years, and I've been super fortunate um, to. Uh, have the life that I have. And so I've been greatly blessed. And I guess in answer to your question, I, I feel that um, I have been uh, very successful in a lot of those ways. Yes, sir. Okay, great. So another question for you right now, would you rather have more money or more time? So I guess both is not an accurate answer there. It's an accurate I, I thought answer. you would say that. <laughs> it's not a fair answer. Um, you know, it's, it's funny when you, when you have money, you don't have time. And, 
when you have time, you generally don't have money. And, uh, and so um, I wasn't really going to get into this, but I'll, but I'll tell you my plan is, um, <clears throat> and, and nothing is set in stone, and we know that uh, with the times that we're living in right now, there's no guarantees, obviously. Um, but my goal at this moment is to retire at the end of next year. And uh, I'll be 60 at that time. I will work for this company for 40 years. And, uh, and, it's, and it's coming a time where I need to get out of the way of the new generations that are coming up behind me um, <clears throat> because they're, they're very capable. Um, and, I, and I don't doubt their abilities one bit. And so I guess I want time and money, Bob, uh, in, in the answer to the question. Okay. Tell me, you've been around a lot of people, both business people and, and just in general. Can you give me a few characteristics that you commonly see of successful people? You know, I sure can. And it's kind of funny as I grew up and watched uh, – you know, of course, my dad owned uh, business and PGTV, and and I can tell you that I really never aspired to be an entrepreneur. Um, you know, I was pretty happy working and making decent money, and and was kind of a stress-free life. Um, and I watched them. Uh, I wouldn't say struggle, but I watched them stress and work many, many hours to uh, make any business work. And and a lot of you know that. And so, so I think the work ethic uh, for me is first and foremost, um, if you do not have a good work ethic, then, then you can't even get off the starting line, um, in my opinion, when it comes to, uh, to a business. Um, you know, you have to be honest in your dealings with your fellow man. Um, there's just so many things that come together for a business person to make it happen. You know, one of the things that I wish that I would have, um, and I throw this out there for uh, a lot of the younger people maybe, one of the things that I wish I would have had more knowledge in, and I'm, I'm getting better at it, but I'm not great at it, is accounting. You know, I wish I'd have studied accounting and numbers more because, you know, you're responsible for your bottom line. If you have a, a, an accountant and everything else, that's great. But the thing is, you need to understand everything that's happening in your company when it comes to dollars and how it's, how it's going out and how it's coming in, what your margins are. Um, and so I wish I was more schooled in the numbers of business. <clears throat> I never took any business classes. And so, you know, I kind of was a blue collar guy who, who <clears throat> wouldn't go away and just rose to the top eventually. Um, and so it's been, it's been good for me. But uh, I, I think, the, I guess my final answer on the question, Bob, is that, uh, you know, when you own a business, you, you're 24-7. You're and if you're not working at the business, you're thinking about the business. And, and that's a little daunting at times, and, and not everybody can handle that, that uh, type of stress. But the work ethic uh, boils down to the greatest asset in my mind of a uh, business owner. Tell me your thoughts on somebody just getting out of high school, going to college or trade school. As far as between trade school and academics? Yes. Well, I've seen, I've seen both be successful. Um, and I'll, and I'll use my son, Trevor, for a moment. Um, and I see these online, so he's probably going to squirm a little bit. But I'll use him as an example. Um, you know, he went to he went to college. Actually, he worked for us for a time. He went to one year of the apprenticeship program, and uh, he decided that the electrical trade really wasn't for him, which was fine. And so he went to school in in, uh, in finance and in banking and things like that, and. Uh, which is awesome. And so we kind of stole him away from the banking uh, world to be our estimator. And we did that in part because we knew he had the numbers background. We knew that he would, would pick up on the estimation program immediately and he, it would be a, a walk in the park for him because of his education. 
So in that case, the education served him quite well. Um, the trade school, I went to a trade school. Um, I wish I had gone to a trade school and a business school, whether they be in community colleges or the full-blown uh, four-year, five-year uh, university. Either way, I lack some business skills. Um, you know, it's not just enough to know how to uh, do the task, to do the discipline that you do. You've got to have the business side of it. So, Bob, I'm not going to venture out and say um, college is bad. College is not bad. College gives everybody a well-rounded uh, thought process, I believe. Um, and so they really need a little bit of both. They need the trades and they need the business sense to make money at the trades. Rob, you've been killing in, me, Bob. You, you've been in business. Well, I want to find out what you know and so does anybody <laughs> else, what you think. That's why you're here. Um, right now, you mentioned that the, uh, the world and the economy is fairly unstable. What do you think things will look like a year from now as far as the economy goes? Well, <clears throat> and that leads me to, uh, to talk or not talk about the COVID, I guess. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I really think um, the big trick to this opening the country back up is, is based on the vaccine. That's just my personal opinion. Uh, I think um, states like Texas and other states <clears throat> who are opening up their, uh, their businesses and things like that is a little bit early. I think our governor shut us down a little bit early um, because I, I feel like we're in the middle of the, the fight like right now. Um, a year from now, I guess I'm optimistic enough, Bob, to think that we'll look back at this experience um, and we'll have a vaccine in place similar to what we do for the flu and that it'll still be a concern of ours, but that we are going to move forward um, and live our lives to the best of our abilities um, without uh, worry of the COVID virus at that point. Okay. So you have a positive outlook for the future? I have a very positive outlook for the future and I really don't know how to have a negative outlook. I mean, we don't have a choice but to stay positive, stay safe, be aware of our surroundings and do the right things to keep ourselves safe. You know, uh, a lot of the people around us have markers <clears throat> that um, if they get the virus, it'll be detrimental possibly to them. And if we don't do it for ourselves, then we need to do it for them. Um, you know, I, I know people are tired of, of it. You know, a lot of people think it's a scare tactic and things like that. Well, if you haven't lost somebody near you or you haven't seen somebody go through the illness that is near you, then maybe that would change their minds. I don't really know. Um, but in a year from now, I'm super optimistic that the market's going to come back. Um, we were a strong economy before this happened. We'll be a strong economy again. Uh, it's just going to take a little while to get back to that. I mean, I hear a lot in the news about socialism. Do you care to make any comments on that? Uh, describe your view of socialism to me, Bob. Well, from what I'm hearing, everybody gets everything for free and everybody's the same and the government takes care of every want and need that we have. Would you be for that? I would not be for that at all. I think it would be the demise of our country. Um, you know, I, I think, and, and I'm going to go out on a limb here, I, I think, you know, similar to the, the native population that we have in New Mexico and we have in Arizona uh, and different places like that. Uh, we have, uh, the government has funded some of their living expenses to the point of where they're not as productive as they once were. And I don't think that they appreciate that. I tell you the truth. Um, I don't think that the American people would appreciate those handouts 
in the long run. And if, they, and if they think they want them and they think they need them, then they're sadly mistaken because we are, humans are, are designed to be productive people. Um, you can see by the stay at home order that, that it's just driving people crazy. They have a need to be productive. They have a need to be wanted. They have a need to, you know, life is about um, having joy. And, and enjoying your life and being happy to the best of your ability. And if, if all we get is handouts and we are not productive people, I guarantee you we will not be happy people. And so people need to be self-sufficient. They need to um, make their own way to the best of their ability. Uh, and the government handouts are, are too much. Okay. Rodney, I hear a lot about debt with business and personally. Can you tell us some of your thoughts on debt? Well, <clears throat> you know, on, on, on some levels, I guess debt is inevitable to some degree um, as far as um, your home and, and things that you need for shelter to survive. Um, it, I, I think the important thing is that we don't get hung up in the, uh, the keeping up with the Joneses type of uh, mentality that we don't live beyond our means. Um, that, you know, unfortunately, we're kind of in a, in a society uh, now that when we think we want it, we want it right then. And a lot of times we'll do whatever it takes to get it right then. We, we need self-satisfaction immediately. Um, and it possibly we don't get on a savings program to save money to buy that vehicle or to go on that cruise or whatever it is. We want it right then. And so oftentimes we borrow the money. To me, that's living beyond our means. Um, if, there, if there are wants and not needs and we're borrowing money for wants, then uh, that's living beyond our means. And I think that um, as a society is concerned, live your life as simple and best you can do not live beyond your means. Rodney, would you tell me your thoughts on tithing? Tithing? Yes, sir. You know, <laughs> um, okay. So, so tithing is a commandment. And, um, you know, everything that we own, Everything that we have, everything that we are, belongs to our Heavenly Father. And <clears throat> so if we're arrogant enough to think that that's not true, then we probably have a, a rude awakening at some point. Um, and so all that he's asking for is for us to pay 10% of everything we have that he has given us anyway, or certainly given us the opportunity to obtain those things. And so um, uh, to be a full tithe payer, uh, especially in, in our religion, is super important. We take it very seriously. Um, it, is, um, it is a commandment, and, and I, I believe we are to follow that commandment. I mean, tell me what you miss the most since this quarantining at home started? You know, it's funny. Um, if you knew the dynamics, and, and maybe you do, and, and several people do, of our <clears throat> group out there, uh, Polson and Grady, where we have, you know, five different companies basically working out of the same yard, the same office complex. And, and sometimes that's a little tricky. Um, you know, uh, the dynamics of that can, can be a little tricky. But the thing that, that I've noticed uh, being at home is we do a ton of networking. Uh, you know, we may cuss each other, but we do a ton of networking out there. And so I feel like I've lost a grip to some degree on uh, running the company. Um, you know, and, and Bryce steps up and does a lot of that. Um, but, but I feel like I've lost that networking ability, and uh, I'm hoping to put an end to that uh, in a couple of weeks is what I'm hoping. So, 
Rodney, do you think your communication skills have improved since the stay-at-home order? <laughs> you know, Bob, I'm not very tech savvy. Um, anybody that knows me knows that. Um, and so I'm set up at home. You know, they set me up a good office at home. Um, I, I feel like my communication skills have probably suffered because I'm more of a uh, let's get together and have a meeting kind of person, not so much what we're experiencing today. And like this, this session that we're having right now, I'd have much rather done in front of an audience mm -hmm. um, and not so much this, this method, although I, I realized this had to be. Uh, and so my communication skills probably suffer more from being isolated than, than not being isolated. Okay. So tell me uh, two or three things that you were the most proud of. Well, you know, I guess the first thing that comes to my mind is my children. <clears throat> because um, they're, they're givers, not takers. They, they, they add to society. They do not take away from society. They're good, productive people. Um, and, and of course, I, I got to give that credit to my wife, Carrie. But <clears throat> I'm proud of my kids um, and the people and the adults that they have become, uh, for sure. Um, Great answer. Thank you. I'm thinking of number two. <laughs> well, that's okay. <clears throat> you know, and I guess I guess the next thing uh, would be that uh, you know I've got some longevity with my wife Carrie, um, and uh, I'll I'll throw a number out there: 36 years, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, it's been a it's been a great marriage, and and I appreciate her. Uh, she has uh, taken care of me in so many ways. And so I, I would use my marriage as a great accomplishment in my life. Um, and I guess the next, the third thing would be <clears throat> the friendships that I have. You know, um, you can make a lot of friends. Uh, and of course, when you grow up in a community like I did here, um, you know, you can make new friends, which is great. And, and they're good friends. But you don't often get friends like you grew up with. And so I guess I would, would say my third accomplishment, and I don't know if it's an accomplishment, would be the relationships that I have uh, with the people that I associate with. Okay. Rodney, we're running out of time. Is there anything else you would like to add before we bring this to a close? Um, not really, Bob. I appreciate the opportunity, kind of. Um, and uh, I hope that there were some takeaways uh, from this session. Well, I know there are because I've been taking notes while you've been talking, a lot of good things. So uh, one last thing I would like to say is I think there are two people watching named Ken and Sandy Eaton. And I think they did a great job of raising you. You turned out really well. So well, congratulations to those two. I know them both. I appreciate you saying so. And, and uh, I, I was definitely born of goodly parents, no doubt. That's good. Rodney, thank you. I want to let everybody know that we will be doing another On the Menu this Thursday, the 7th, and our guest will be Bobby Martinez, and Bobby will be talking about surviving in business in uncertain times. So that what a great topic. And Rodney, thank you for sharing all of your experiences and your wisdom. I hope we all get back to doing business as we were before and not having to stay home all the time. So Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate you. You bet. Goodbye. Oof.